Hello, everybody. I'm Melinda Jones. I am the National President of National Council of Jewish Women of Australia. And for the last four or five years, National Council of Jewish Women of Australia has been an affiliate of you the World Peace. And we have been uh, engaged in a whole lot of different ways with Women Wage Peace. But since October the 7th, many people have come out and spoken to someone either in Australia or in Israel and said, we'd like to do something. We'd like to be involved in Women Wage Peace. What can we do if we're in Australia? And a number of people have already done, taken certain actions. Um, on one occasion, there was a webinar that was very, very well attended where the proceeds of the webinar went to Women Wage Peace. And another occasion, there was an educational uh, webinar around. And these are just things that people have done off their own bat, thinking they're things that they'd like to do for women wage peace. So the idea tonight is for us to talk about whether there is a way we can have some sort of movement in Australia or representation or um, body of people who are all dedicated to working together for women wage peace in a way that is of value to people in Australia but of course of even more value to people in Israel. It's no use us doing things that um, make us feel good if they don't actually change anything on the ground in Israel, because that's what we are on uh, at this, with this particular project. It's about women wage peace. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, I'm on the land of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation in uh, Melbourne. And uh, I know from our greetings to each other that there are people all over the country who are on the lands of different uh, nations of Indigenous people. And it's really very important to us that we maintain our relationship and our respect with Indigenous people, particularly when we're looking at projects where uh, our identity, which is caught up as Jewish women of Australia, and of course, I think there should be some non-Jewish women here as well tonight. We'll get move on to that. Um, but National Council is Jewish women. The starting point in Israel is to have a land for Palestinians and Jewish people, women, children, that is a safe place to live. And we want that in Australia as well, of course, as we want it in Israel. So I pay my respects to all of those elders across the country. So I became involved in Women Wage Peace about five years ago. And I became involved because, because I was in Israel and someone said, oh, there's this really interesting organization and they're having a demonstration. Why don't you go and find out what's going on? And it was a walk from um, one end of town to the other. We uh, were at the I'm probably going to get it wrong. We were at the Jordan River with the president of Liberia, walked up to uh, to Jerusalem and finished the night outside the house of the president. And in that walk, which lasted about seven hours, we got on buses some of the time, but we walked from one end of the country to the other. We talked to all the other people around us and they were people from a very big range of backgrounds and ages uh, Palestinian women, Druze women, Christian women, Jewish women, all of whom had one objective, which was the achievement of peace. And so when I became involved in Women Wage Peace, I knew this was a place for me, because this was a place where people believed the fundamental thing I believed, that what we all want is a good life. What we all want is a secure life. We want a safe life for our children. And this was a place where other women were calling for that in the context of a place that I loved being a Jewish woman and a Zionist from before I could talk. And one of the questions that's always arisen for me is, if you're in Australia, what is the use of being involved in some project that's in another country? How useful is it? It might be useful for me. It might make me feel good. But how useful is it for women wage peace? So National Council of Jewish Women has run some sessions where we've done fundraising about uh, for women wage peace, which we think is important. But we've also done sessions 
of education, about various aspects of the peace process, about various aspects of the work of women wage peace, and different aspects of being an activist. And they're things that we've done over the years that I've been involved in. Where are we going to end up after tonight? Who knows? But that's where we started. Um, we're going in the evening to talk a little bit about women wage peace and why it exists and um and uh and then we're going to talk about how useful it is to be involved in the priest police process. We're going to talk then in small groups about what each of you may have to offer the process and then where do we go from here. We have uh, three incredible women helping us this evening. Uh, the first, um, I'll introduce them actually, uh, they, I'll name them. One is Amanda Gordon, another is Peter Jones Pillar, and the, the, the third is, uh, is Regula Alon. And uh, I'll introduce them a bit further when we come to the time. I think I'll start by showing you a video and uh, about women wage peace. And it's not that one. Sorry, it's just going to take me a second to share screens and find the right thing. I, while I'm doing this, I, I, I should... So, share screen. My uh, normal Zoom master is not here, and I don't know if I can share this because I think it's going to share the one way. moment. We've currently got a blank screen. Give it a moment to load. Hopefully, okay. load. It's not the right thing. Um, would it? Would you like? like talk? Could you, Peter? Could you share it? Sorry, it will take me a moment to it because I just got to open it because I didn't know I was going to do this, but I can do this. I'm sure. Um, let me see. Who shared it with me yesterday? Da, da, da. Sorry, it'll take just one second for me as well. Maybe we should both keep trying. Um, here we go. All Be right. sure to um, share, share sound first in Zoom. First click on the share sound button and then share screen and play if there's sound. Okay, mm. okay. so let me go share screen, um, share sound. Yes, I've clicked that, and then I have to go here, and then we'll go. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can make it. Their lives matter, not because they are Palestinians or Israeli. Their lives matter because they are our children. We spent every second night in bomb shelters. Thousands died, but that is not where we are in Northern Ireland now. Six months ago, we celebrated 25 years of the peace process known as the Good Friday Agreement. We don't want to lose more children to this conflict. We hear that you say no to violence and conflict and yes to peace. I am really, really proud to be a partner with you in this, in your peace building efforts.
That's why as hard as it is, we must keep pursuing peace. We must keep pursuing a path so that Israel and the Palestinian people can both live safely, in security, in dignity, and in peace. Thank you, Peter. Um, and you can see that women wage piece took time and thought carefully about what to write in the post uh, October the seventh environment, when a mere three days earlier we'd been celebrating as uh, friends and colleagues. To get going, we're going to talk first with Amanda Gordon. Amanda Gordon is a clinical and health psychologist in private practice in Sydney. She's the founder of National Psychology Week and well known for bringing psychological wisdom to the public through her media work, especially on ABC radio. She particularly addresses issues of grief, bereavement, trauma, and the impacts of relationships. She's the past president of the Australian Psychological Society, the peak professional body of over 27,000 members. She's one of 15 honorary fellows acknowledged for her contribution to the APS in the Australian community. But I can tell you that more important than that, Amanda has been involved in Refugee Week committees, in the New South Wales Reconciliation Council, in Psychology for Refugees, and a whole range of other really important initiatives by psychologists for human rights and for the well-being of, uh, of our fellow people. Amanda is going to talk to us tonight about about safety and respect in times of conflict. Amanda, over to you. Thanks, Melinda. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners. I'm in the land of the Gadigal people in Sydney, New South Wales, spread out. And I know we are all sisters in this. And I feel that particularly tonight. I want to say that I don't have a prepared speech, but I felt it was really important. Melinda felt it was really important that we talk a little bit about safety and how many of us have been feeling relatively unsafe in the spaces in which we work and communicate in Australia in particular. The lack of safety means that people have been either frightened to speak out or more worryingly have been speaking out stridently in a way that's promoted division rather than promoting peace and support for each other. And I hope that this evening we can see that we're all here to support each other and therefore we can shed that horrible sense of abandonment that so many of, especially Jewish women, have been feeling, that sense of abandonment, you know, that me too, unless you're a Jew, uh, that sense of the women's and feminist organisations internationally who have let us down, who have ignored us and have ignored what has happened to us and the pain that, and suffering that we've had. And if we can just let go of those feelings of abandonment and recognise that for heaven's sake, there are 59 people on this call who all want peace, 59 women who are saying we're there with each other and we're there for each other. May I say that in the last weeks, not only have people reached out to me, but when I have reached out for support because I have felt unsafe, I have invariably found that people want peace. They want to support us and they want to support each other and they want to know that we are okay. And so this evening, we're hoping that we can all be okay and talk kindly and comfortingly to each other, especially in the breakout rooms where you'll get a chance actually to connect with other people in a really special way that might lead to some really important action. I, with Melinda and in fact, Peter, were at that, um, we were all together at that march in Israel just three days before the world changed. And we've felt and knew that the women there were there to support each other and to be with each other and we need to continue that feeling and that's what we're doing this evening. So we've made the chat one by which the administrators, if you write a question or write something on the chat, the administrators will see them and they'll ensure that they get passed on so we can address your concerns and your issues. But you're safe here. You don't have to worry about what's being written and be hypervigilant because we've all become a bit like that in the last weeks. We've become hypervigilant. We've spent our time looking at social media and the media. Instead of allowing ourselves to both reflect inwardly and understand our own feelings and reach out in a way that's not frenetic. 
And that's what I hope it can be this evening. Melinda, I'm happy to talk further either now or at some other point, but I hope that those introdu introductory words will allow people to feel free to contribute in this safe space as we work towards a more and more safe community in which we live in Australia and then also contribute with that towards being able to support people in Israel. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, one of the things that Amanda has offered to do is to be here should anyone get distressed during the course of the evening. Um, and uh, we've been doing this quite a lot recently and found it very, very helpful to have someone that you can just duck out into a breakout room and have a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody who can give you support should anything happen that you find distressing. Uh, and so you'll be able to, you're able to be in contact with our Zoom master, Shoshi, who is filling in at the last minute and doing an amazing job. And uh, she'll be able to link you to Amanda should there be a need for that. If you feel any way that that would help you, please take advantage of the opportunity. Thanks, Melinda. Okay, I now want to introduce you to the two women we have from Israel. Um, I actually don't want to introduce them to, the, to them. Um, Shoshi, if we can have the three of us spot, spotlighted, I actually want them to introduce themselves to you because I think that's going to be a much more uh, useful thing to happen if we can have regular as well. Um, because one of the questions that uh, I uh, thought we should start with is, um, what does Women Wage Peace mean to you and why did you join? And perhaps in answering that question, each of you, um, in turn, you might be able to tell us a bit about your biography, about how it is that you have come to there. Perhaps we'll start with regular and uh, then move on to Peter. Okay, good evening, everybody. And I'm really happy to be here, really honoured to, to talk to Australia. I've never been there. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a native uh, Israeli. I was born and grew up in Switzerland, and I um, made Aliyah, or immigrated to Israel in 1981 after I met a Jewish Israeli man in Europe, and um, he's still my partner <laughs> for 45 years. And um, we have three grown-up children. We have uh, four grandchildren so far, uh, all small ones. Uh, and I made Israel my home with a lot of uh, pa passion. And um, I worked in a uh, high-tech companies for 20 years in uh, marketing communications. Uh, and after my and it was a really pioneering experience. I just give you a little, you know, just some idea of um, of um, Israel back then in the nineties, in the in the year two thousand, and uh, so far, it was an amazing experience of uh, of pioneering spirit. Is but like the second generation after the first generation of our agriculture and building up the land. Now we're building up a startup nation and uh, there was a lot of pioneering spirit and making the country healthy and wealthy. And that's what we did. Yeah. So after my kids grew up, um, I was able to leave the, the office, which is really not what I like to. If I don't like to sit in an office and uh, I studied uh, and I was a licensed uh, tour guide. Uh, moving around with uh, tourist groups, especially German speaking, uh, because that's my native language, but also a little bit of English speaking um, in all over Israel and uh, bringing, showing them the country, the beauty of the country, connecting to, um, to their different religions, to the traditions. So, and I felt that it's like a Zionist uh, call, you know, to bring the people close to, to the land and to their whatever traditions. Uh, so I've been doing this for the last 10 years, uh, minus uh, COVID and, uh, and the wars, yeah. when uh, tourism collapses. Um, I joined Women Wage Peace in 2017 and 2020 when COVID uh, um, uh, started, uh, I found myself uh, being becoming very, very active in uh, in women wage peace. I joined the movement because I felt this is my next call. Yeah, after the pioneering and the Zionism, working for 
for peace, working for a future for ourselves, for, for my children, and mainly for our, for our grandchildren. Because I truly believe, and I think that's why we are all here, uh, that war is not a solution, violence is not a solution, and the only solution will be negotiations, um, a political horizon, a political solution, and and it and women must be very much involved in it. And that's what was always lacking. And that's why I felt myself so connected to women wage peace. And I'm a, um, a co um, co coordinator of the foreign relations team of women wage peace. I'm mainly sitting in the background, writing the newsletter, um, writing yeah, things that I hope you get it, and uh, the new website. Uh, so that's what I'm mainly doing. Uh, and I truly believe that having you on board, you and we have we have Tessa here from uh, from England. We have calls from Canada, from Germany. We're going to build up uh, supporter groups in other countries as well. And uh, I think it's very, very important to have you all uh, to to tell the world that not everything is violence and arm here, but there is a different voice. Thank you so Thank much. You all. P Peter, would you like to? Yeah. I, yes, I, well, it's it's a hard act to follow, of course, and I'm part of Regula's team in the foreign relations team. She's my coordinator, and um, that's fairly recent. How I came to be connected with Women Wage Peace is through a friend. How often does that happen with women that we, we join organizations? A colleague and a friend, uh, I don't know if you know, I've mentioned Sheila Shalev, was a colleague in another, um, another interfaith, intercultural group of which I was part. And she said to me a year after the movement was founded, and that she was participating in sitting in a tent outside the prime minister's house where women were fasting for 50 days because of the 50 days of the previous Gaza war. Um, they weren't each fasting 50 days. There were actually 25 women who each two days, but it was, and she was sitting in this tent and would I, would I come? And when she mentioned women wage peace, I hadn't heard about it. But the minute I walked into that tent and started speaking to the women, I knew this was something I wanted to be engaged with. First of all, as many of you know, my, my Zionism and my love of Israel has always been there. I chose to go and live in Israel as a fulfillment of a lifelong dream. And I still feel incredibly privileged to live here. I feel I'm part of something really important. Um, my professional work in Israel has primarily been in interfaith relations and dialogue. I do a lot of teaching about Judaism in Christian organizations and Christianity and Islam in Jewish organizations. And um, that's been a, a major part of my life here. So um, gradually the Jerusalem team in Women Wage Peace, and we, I don't think we're gonna mention that Women Wage Peace is a volunteer organization. We only have now, and if we didn't have at the beginning any paid workers. Now we only have two, we're a movement of 50,000 people. All of us give our time voluntarily. And the Jerusalem team, whom I consider my dear, dear friends and sisters, um, that team engaged me partly because of my interfaith um, connections to um, host or be part of several panels and discussions. And gradually through them um, making me feel so welcome and so in, um, so uh, vital and, and part of this, this wonderful movement, I became of course more and more engaged. Melinda and I were together at that um, march she just described a few years ago where we, um, we really did feel part of something bigger, something something momentous. And I think that that is still a feeling I have with Women Wage Peace, that in this terrible time, when so much of, um, of the country is only able to despair, we maintain our hope. And we maintain our hope through continuing with our connections of our partner organizations, the Palestinian Movement Women of the Sun. We haven't stopped that. We continue our hope by looking and having our eye to the future. And another, uh, you know, the day after, 
And another aspect of our work in Women Wage Peace is, of course, support for the hostages and the families of the hostages, because as mothers, we reach out to other mothers and family members. So we're very active we're, we're, and we're very hopeful, even in the despair, because there's a lot of, of course, concern about the hostages particularly, and of course the losses, because every soldier that's lost is a child, somebody's child, somebody's husband, somebody's partner. And so there's, there's a lot of grief at the moment in this country, and we keep the hope alive. And I think similarly for people who uh, want to join Women Wage Peace from outside Israel, part of it is being part of the hope, being part of the future, being part of what will happen after this war. And I think that that's another reason why it's just so, so important that we have partners with, with primarily women, men are welcome to join us too, but primarily women from outside. And the final thing I'll say, uh, Melinda, is that um, as you probably know, I'm, I consider myself part of the religious community, a religious woman. And in Women Wage Peace, it is across every political view but I feel we don't have enough religious women who are part of this. Religious women are often associated with, with more right wing. It doesn't have to be. And in fact, my religion makes me an advocate for peace. And I consider one of my positions in Women Wage Peace, and, and it's supported by my colleagues, as I said, particularly in the Jerusalem group, is to try and draw more religious women in and, and say, we don't have to be fighting for peace in the different way or a separate way, we can be part of this whole movement of Israeli and Palestinian mothers and women who dream and envision peace. Thank you very much, Peter. We've had some questions um, come in, at, but it's sort of the question that is sort of on everybody's lips in a way is, after October 7, can you stay friends with Palestinians and uh, you know, is this really a viable movement um, to work together? Can we, do we have partners? Um, we know we've got the Jewish women from uh, Women Wage Peace, but what about, do we really have partners to work with? Other people who want peace? Regular? Yeah. Would you like, you put it as a question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there, um, we do have a connection with our Palestinian partners of uh, Women of the Sun. It's, um, it's, you can imagine that it's uh, not very easy. Uh, we also have for some time, they were really, the, like the relations were a little bit uh, in secrecy because they were endangered uh, by their community. But uh, lately, during the past uh, two weeks, they, um, they have come out uh, publicly. Um, yesterday was a concert in uh, Berlin uh, by the Berliner Philharmonica. Um, and it was both in our name uh, in the, uh, for Women Wage Peace and for Women of the Sun. Uh, we are again public. We we talk together. We And uh, there is a relationship that is uh, being announced publicly again even so it's it's rather difficult at the moment Peter. i think the other thing is on a personal level many of us have dear friends who are palestinian um and we we feel with them and for them and there there's no doubt that there have been some strains in relationships there's no doubt um, I've mentioned in other fora that, that at least one of my Palestinian colleagues did not believe for a good two weeks the stories about October 7. He actually didn't believe it had happened. And so they even just that the his inability to, of course, empathise with what was going on in Gaza was because he didn't believe Hamas had attacked that way on October 7. So that these sorts of the, the different stories that are being told and also the media that we're watching is so, so different that there's no doubt that the stress and strain, but our personal relationships and trust, the women that, that trusted us, they still trust us. And I think this is part of the work that we've done 
and all of us in Women Wage Peace have lives beyond Women Wage Peace as well. So I'm not saying that it's only been because of the of the movement that this has happened, but I do think that um, we have shown as a movement that we are trustworthy, that we have an ear and empathy for the other narrative as well as our own. We don't let go of our narrative at all, but we are we we hear the different pains of different people. And I think that the trust that we've built is made, is sustainable. I'm going to just pose some extra questions to you, if I may, from the chat. Um, can we just have some clarity on who is Women of the Sun, please? Okay, Women, is the, Women of the Sun is a Palestinian women uh, peace movement. Uh, they exist for two and a half years now. Uh, and it's a, it's our sister, our th those are our si sister peace movement that are uh, in the Palestinian territories, yeah, working together with us. So, for example, Women for the Sun coming to the demonstration, uh, uh, to the match that we had in October, actually put them at risk. They that they actually um, were at risk of being seen as betraying their people by working with our people but nonetheless they came through to the, through to participate yes they i think they're, they're my heroes there's no doubt whatsoever Riam who started the movement and and other women uh, are incredible um i think that the other part of the clarity shashi perhaps is that israel israel's movement women wage peace does include israeli Muslim and Christian um, Israeli um, Palestine, Israeli Palestinians are part of Women Wage Peace, but the women who are members of Women of the Sun are Palestinian women who are not Israeli women. So I think that might be part of the confusion because we do have non-Jewish women as part of Women Wage Peace as well. Fantastic. We've got some really difficult questions coming in from the audience. Um, so I hope. Um, we're ready for some of these. Is that all right, Melinda? Yeah, you, you can really only ask one more because we've really got a program. One more. Okay. Uh, let to, let me ask just this one. Um, because you're in Israel as Women Wage Peace, one of our big issues on the outside of Israel is the narrative that we are constructing. Um, a lot of women, and in fact, a lot of people here um, are pro-Israel in the sense that we believe that it should absolutely exist and we want it to, to thrive, but we are also pro-quality uh, of life for the Palestinian communities. Um, and where one of the major struggles for the diaspora community that keeps coming up is how do we navigate that narrative um, of straddling the, um, the nuance when um, you're dealing with diaspora communities when the diaspora is demanding that you choose a side, um, that would be really helpful. Can you answer on that? I'll I'll give it a go. Um, the truth is that the in Israel the community itself is divided about fifty fifty politically. And we know that, and that's why we haven't been able to get a stable government for many years now. Um, Israelis themselves are the are the most critical of the of um, governmental decisions and so on. But when it comes to this particular war, even those of us who are peace activists and do not believe that this a war is going to solve a problem, we can't other than see this particular war as as justified as a war can be, we, we're responding. We were attacked and we're responding. And so at this time in Israel, it is not only not wise, but it's probably not even desired to speak out against the war. It's not, this is not something we are going to do in Israel now. On the other hand, we are going to continue to push for a vision beyond the war and amazingly enough it's amazing to me as an Australian who grew up where America was the big bad enemy that drew us into the Vietnam War and we didn't learn but <laughs> amazingly enough it's been Joe Biden and America who've made our government face the fact 
that we for a long time have not had a vision of the day after. We haven't had a plan and and women OH peace have said we need a negotiated settlement. We're not the ones to say what that final vision should look like, but that we need a negotiated settlement. And finally, finally, there is some pressure on our current government to recognise that we need a negotiated settlement. We're allowed to be critical of the government and push them and say, what is your vision? What is the vision for the day after? And you as Australian Jews or women outside who might not like war and probably don't like war. I suspect if you're on this call, you're not um, a a aggressive in your, in your attitude, can say, yes, you're absolutely right. War is not going to solve anything. We're not going to get, this war is not going to bring an end to the suffering of Palestinians or the suffering of Israelis. It's not. This war is unfortunately a costly war that Hamas forced on us but it's not going to solve the issue. We have to focus on the future. What is a future that we want? How do we want to live together in the future? In my interfaith work, I often am forced to, to say, we may not agree on the way we describe what's happened in the past, but what we can agree on is what we have a, a vision for the future, a vision um, that, that says we have to find a way of living together. Um, and I think that, it's, it doesn't help. It's not helpful to say, well, we hold by this narrative. We hold by this story. We, this is what happened to us and, and insist that somebody agree with what happened in order to move forward. As a person who used to teach history, I used to take the line that if you don't understand what's happened in the past, you, you can't move forward in the future. I still think there's some truth to that. But I think in terms of where we are now, it's far more important for us to agree on what has to happen in the future than it is to try and get any sort of agreement on what's happening, or what's happened in the past. And it's also far more important to say it is legitimate to demand from Israel that they have a vision of after this war, but it's not legitimate to demand from Israel or to say to Israel, you shouldn't have, have shouldn't be in this war because it's not a war we chose or started. Is that some response. I don't know if it's, I know it's not adequate, but at least it's a response. 